Hey, Luisa, welcome to the show. Thanks so much for having me. I'm excited to chat. So why don't we just jump in? Tell us a little bit about your story. Yeah, my gosh. So to get to the the, the briefest bit of this, um, basically about five, no, six years ago, I was in a really good job. I was in digital advertising, six figure salary, you know, the, the corporate dream. And uh, I just was not feeling like it was everything I thought it would be. So I tried a few different online businesses, I'm sure we'll go into that, and ended up uh, taking my job skills at the time and building a business around that. Replaced my income, left it, then people started asking me, hey, how are you able to do that? So I started sharing that with them, grew into my current business, helping people go from employee to entrepreneur, and super long story short, here we are. Amazing. Okay. So you were able to replace your six figure salary. How long did it take you? Cause you were like yes. doing your business part time. Yeah. Yeah. So here's the thing. Technically from when I made my first sale, uh, doing digital advertising consulting to when I crossed over six figures, it was four months. However, I always want to caveat that before that, you know, I'd been trying lots of different business ideas and just failing for about three to four years. Um, before it all came together. I think so, that's definitely important to know exactly. because a lot of times people see like that end result of it only took you four months to do this, but they don't see the struggle and the failure. Talk to us about the failure part. So what are some of the things you tried and lessons that you learned? Oh my learned? gosh, so many failures. And I think that's so important to, to talk about. Uh, so first I wasn't sure what idea, what business I could start. So I, I tried quite a few. Uh, for example, I tried Microsoft Excel consulting and I'm looking back and I see this happen nowadays a lot as well, where I saw a lot of people doing it. I was like, oh man, I can do this. I do this in my job. People are making multiple six or seven figures. Why the heck couldn't I? So there was a lot of arrogance there. And then I jumped right in. I didn't do any market research about who my audience would be or what they would want to buy from me about that. And so I was writing these blog articles about really cool, fancy Microsoft Excel shortcuts and nobody cared. Cause I hadn't, you know, I didn't care about my audience. I didn't even know. Um, and it, it was honestly, I ended up not doing it because I realized, Oh, I do this all day in my job. I don't want to spend my time outside of work talking about it. And yeah. so I forgot to take that into account. Another thing I tried was career coaching. And so, you know, over the years I have had so many people ask me, Hey, how do you transition industries? Uh, so just a bit of background. I went from, um, being an engineer for the space station to financial services to digital advertising. So people were like, you know, how do you do that? How do you get to six figures, manage a team, all of that. And so I started doing that. I did make uh, good uh, sales and good money and have clients that I really appreciated. But what I ended up realizing was I figured, Hey, I'm going to give you this great advice. You're going to get to where I am in your career. At some point, you're going to want to leave corporate just like I want to. And so it didn't really feel good talking about that. And so what ended up happening was I just had to say, look, I, I don't want to do this anymore because it doesn't feel good to me. And that's when I started thinking, do I even have another business inside of me? You know, like, do I have anything else people would be willing to pay for? And it was staring, like it was in front of me the whole time. Oh, your job skills, duh. <laughs> Totally. Okay. So you started the business. So what exactly were you doing in that business? Yeah. So like I said, this was about six or so years ago. And yeah. what I was doing was I was working for a, a digital advertising startup that managed ads for really big companies like BMW and Mercedes. And one of the pieces was Facebook advertising. And so I, I knew like how to run ads. I knew what kind of ads worked well, just like all of the things that a few years, I mean, even nowadays, but just a few years ago, you know, ads managers, informational, that was like not common at all. And so I remember going into Facebook groups and seeing people ask questions about really relatively basic questions. Hey, how do I run an ad? What's good? What's bad? What, what's working? And thinking, whoa, I can answer these. I literally just did a presentation on this at work. And so I reached out to someone who was asking these questions and I said, Hey, I don't have anything to sell you. I'm actually just trying to do some market research. And this is what I do in my job. So if you answer some basic questions for me, I will answer all of your questions about this. And so we had a back and forth on that. She helped me out a lot. I helped her out a lot. 
two weeks later, she reached out to me again out of the blue and said, Hey, you gave me so much amazing value for free. How can I hire you? And it was, yeah, it was so cool because I actually had to go back to her and say, okay, please give me a week. I'm going to do some research and figure out what price is fair, what package is fair. Cause I didn't even have an idea what I could charge. Mm -hmm. And so we did that, but because I had already given her so much value up front, she knew, I knew what I was talking about. And she was basically in before we even had that conversation. That's amazing. And that's what I teach my clients to do too. in those market research interviews, like those, that's such a good opportunity to get new clients in the door. And Gosh, yes. I love that it ended up being what your full-time job is that you started the business about. And it's so funny. One of my clients, she, she came to me and she had all these business ideas and she's like, I want to do this and this and this. And I was like, what's your day job? And she does kind of like Facebook ads, <laughs> marketing, that kind of thing. I was like, right. why, why don't you just do that? And she was like, oh, I hadn't even thought right? of that. <laughs> the most obvious solution is right in front of us, but it seems so simple. It just doesn't feel like that could possibly work. Yeah. So, okay. You got that first client. Then what happened? So I realized, oh, hey, this is kind of working. Let me see if I can do this a little bit more. Thankfully, I mean, I really had no clue at the time, but <laughs> thankfully I kept on doing that. And so I continued being in Facebook groups. And what I did was I just, every day I would show up, I would, you know, and the thing is people always ask me, hey, how did you make the time? Yes, I did have to be really disciplined with my schedule, but at the same time, I wasn't spending a lot of time on my business because all really I was doing, I wasn't trying to set up a fancy website or funnels or anything. I was saying, hey, I got my first client from a Facebook group. I'm just going to continue doing that. So every day I would set aside 15 to 30 minutes, go into some groups, and it was a handful, so not like 20 or 30. I would share one piece of information. Hey, this works well, this doesn't, just something really helpful. I would answer people's questions that they had about running their ads. And if someone commented on my post or anything, I would respond. And if it led into a conversation, then I would just continue having that conversation. And then every uh, few weeks, I would offer some free calls where I would say, hey, I'm going to give massive value and you can walk away with it. I'm uh, not going to, you know, try and do a switch and bait or give you false info, like, you know, not give you amazing value. If you want, after you get this amazing value to hear more about how you can work with me, then we can talk about that, but that's not required. And so I just kept on doing that. And because I was so consistent, I showed up, I gave amazing value that just started the ball rolling and having more and more people reach out and ask me how they could work with me. Amazing. So you're working at your full-time job. How many hours would you say you were putting into your business at that time? So it was definitely a snowball effect. When I first started, uh, the thing is, and I'm sure you see this too with your clients, when you start out, it's really hard to believe that it's possible, right? Yeah. And so to even work 30 minutes a day feels so hard because it's like, do I really need to be doing this? Should I just be relaxing and all of that? And so in the beginning, it was literally just like 30 minutes a day. Yeah. And then as I was seeing more proof, it, be, it was becoming more fun. People were asking me more questions. I had clients. It just grew and grew and grew. So it did grow to a point where every free minute, it felt like outside of work, I was working on my business, but it was a natural evolution from just starting with 30 minutes a day. Totally. Yeah. So is this a business that you grew to a million dollars in 11 months? No. So I grew that to six figures in okay. four, within four months. Okay. And then that's when I turned in my notice. I was doing this, but I noticed a lot of people were asking me how I had done it. Yeah. And this was something I had had in the back of my mind because remember, like we talked about, I spent three or four years figuring this out and I felt like there wasn't any one place I could go to, to teach me all of this information in one place. Like there were things that that I went years without realizing I even had to learn like sales calls, right? right? It seems simple now that I know what's going on, but I didn't even know I would have to do sales calls or how to do sales calls, how to sell, um, how to do copywriting, all of that. And so I thought, you know what? I did this. I also hadn't seen anybody who had built their business while in their job. And so I didn't even know that was possible for a really long time. Yeah. And so I thought, you know what, I'm going to be the example that I wish I'd had when I was doing this. And so I'm going to share with you guys what exactly I went through. And so I started doing that. And then that's the business I grew to uh, over a million dollars. Amazing. 
Okay. So one of the things that I saw, you said you created a launch strategy for launching courses and group programs, creating $800,000 in sales per launch consistently without affiliates share with us. What does that process look like? Yes. Yes. So this is, I mean, I love this strategy. Obviously it's been life and business changing for me and we've done that consistently over about the last four to five years. And so it is, I mean, it's just like when you're putting yourself out there, I feel like in trying to just show up and give amazing value, amazing things happen. And that was kind of the origin of this launch strategy. It wasn't like I sat down and was like, oh, let me be brilliant. You know, it was really, um, I remember during my very first launch, I didn't have a large audience. I didn't want to do any of the traditional uh, launch strategies like a video series because Mm -hmm. I wasn't going to, I didn't know if my launch would flop or not. I wasn't going to put thousands of dollars into a video series and who knew if it would pay off or not. And so I just thought, okay. And this was around the time when Periscope was like really hot and everyone was on it. And I remember thinking, Hey, my Periscope, uh, live streams are doing really well. People have been finding me and just saying, Hey, I love the way you come across on video. And so I thought, okay, well, why don't I continue doing this? And maybe I do a few a day. So instead of a video series, I do a live stream series uh, over a few days. And then what I did again, this was before challenges were, you know, super popular and all over the place. But I thought, okay, why don't I combine it with not just passive watching me talk, but a, a, a challenge type of event. And so what I did was I created a five to seven day challenge where every day I would give someone a super simple prompt that would take them maybe 15 minutes to do, but be really impactful. And then I would ask them to go into my Facebook group and respond. And I would give a lot of amazing free coaching to help them on their responses. And then after that, I would talk about the prompt that I had given that day on Periscope and I would address the questions and responses people had put into the group. So it made it feel really personal Mm -hmm. and I would answer questions on live and I would do that over my first challenge was about five days. Nowadays, my challenges are 10 days. So around that time frame, and basically over that time, people just get really excited about my program. They would really build a relationship with me and they would say, Oh, wow, this is so different. Someone's actually talking to me, remembering my name. Every single thing I say is getting a response specifically from Louisa. And that would just really build an amazing relationship that would make people excited to join my program. Mm -hmm. And so there's one other thing I did that I I really want to mention because it made a big difference. I thought, what would make me want to participate in a challenge? Because I'm sure you've seen, you know, it can be easy to get excited about something and then just forget about it. And so I love a good, you know, competition, prizes, things like that. And so I thought, okay, what if I make this like a fun competition type thing? And I ended up adding points to each prompt that people could earn. And so I had a point system where, for example, for every prompt that you do over the five to 10 days, you get, let's say five points. Every place where you share your response on a different social platform, on a different group, wherever, you get an additional number of points, like maybe two points. And if you show up to the live stream, you get a bonus number of points. So that if you, and there were really great prizes, like first prize, first place was a free seat in my program. And anyone who participated in case you didn't want to, you know, go all out and, and just get as many points as possible. I said, Hey, that's okay. But if you participate every single day and get the base minimum number of points, I'm going to put everyone who does that into a raffle to get 10 hours with a VA to help you get started and set up the tech stuff because that's, that's hard when you're starting out. Yeah. And so that really made it fun for people as well. And there were some people who just do the, the daily minimum to get in the raffle. And then there were some people, I have had challenges where people would get like 400 points right? And because they shared it all over the place because they're like, I want to get the the free seat in the program. Yeah. And they would do that. And that would inspire other people to want to participate more as well. And just, just add that like incentive to show up every day and be like, Oh, I'm collecting my points. So that made a really big difference as well. So all of these combined really, uh, really made a big difference. So to put it into perspective with my first ever program launch, I started with maybe a hundred to 200 people on my list, if even. So yeah. that's basically nothing in the grand schemes of, in the grand scheme of what, you know, people, the, is a general baseline recommendation to have before you launch a course or program. And I ended up selling 50 
15 spots. No, no, no. I'm sorry. 18 spots for about $8,000. Hmm. And that, and that was because I, my conversion rates were through the roof. It wasn't like a baseline 1%, 2% conversion rate. It was way higher because of how much I was showing up, how people were saying, hey, this is not just another course where it's self-study. This is someone who's going to show up for me massively. Obviously, this Louisa person knows what she's talking about because she's answering all of my questions for free. And that really is what I've done over the years and continue to do every time I have a program launch. And again, like to have my first $800,000 launch, my audience was only a few thousand people at the time. Hmm. And it was, I mean, to be honest, <laughs> if looking back, I'm kind of like, how did I even have the, the guts to say, oh, I'm going to shoot for this big launch. My numbers were completely off. Yeah. It was because I was really knowing, hey, I'm going to convert ridiculously high because I'm going to actually connect with people versus just sending them emails or videos and expecting them to have a one-way engagement or conversation. Okay. That's huge. Um, I want to go back to the point system. Do you track this or do you have them track it themselves? Yes. I always get this question and it's so important because you definitely don't want to be when you're running a challenger at any point, really having to say, okay, let me go and track. That's everyone. a lot of work. <laughs> it is. No, no, no. We don't do that. So what I say is at the end of every day, after you've done your points, you email in to us your own tally. So you have to be proactive and do the work. Now there is a bit of an honor system, but pretty much everyone is pretty respectful of the points. And we do ask that you provide screenshots proving all the places you've shared this to tally up your points. So like the screenshots of you in different groups on your Instagram, wherever, so that it really is like, you know, yeah, you can win awesome prizes, but show up and do some work and help us as well. Yeah. Okay, cool. So you started at five day challenges. Now you're doing 10 day challenges. Why did you make that switch? Yeah. So there were a few reasons. The first reason was because my, I would continue growing my program and added more content to it and also raised the prices. Mm -hmm. So at this point, the program, when I run it live is $3,000 and that's a significant investment. And so I want to make sure that I, and there's so much content to cover. I want to make sure that I cover little pieces of everything. So people understand how comprehensive the program is. Mm -hmm. Um, the other reason is just because I have gotten more and more comfortable to be honest, doing live streams, talking with people. And I've just found that 10 days is the perfect length for me to convey what I want to convey, but also to have a relationship with the people who are showing up every day. Five days feels a little bit short, but by day 10, the people who are showing up every single day, even around day seven, you know, we're like chatting like old friends. Oh, Hey, you know, we talked about this for you on day one, day two, et cetera. And so it just feels like a really good amount of time. That's not too short, but also not too long yeah. to really be getting people excited and building up that and anticipation and momentum for enrollment into my program. Got it. And so when you do the 10 days, do you do like five days on weekend off five days on, or is it 10 days no, all together? It's 10 days straight. So okay. my challenge nowadays, uh, it's called the weekend empire challenge. And so it's that theme. We do start on the weekend, unlike most challenges, just to be like, Hey, I get it. You don't have a lot of time. Uh, but then what we do is we will go every day during the week as well. And what I'll do is I'll say, Hey, I get it during the weekends are the prompts might be a little bit more in depth and take a little bit longer because you have more time. And during the week I'll schedule it so that the challenge might take you five to 10 to 15 minutes. Okay. And so these challenges, they're all free. Have you ever done a paid challenge? I have not. I just to be honest, challenges for free have worked out so well for me. Yeah. I would rather do a, just give amazing information away for free and then yeah. have a premium program versus it honestly just doesn't feel, I don't want to say worth it, but I'm just like, look, I'd rather have as many people participate as possible for free versus yeah. trying to sell it for a lower price point. Yeah. Um, you know, and, and then focus my attention on a more premium program. Yeah, gonna, for sure. For yeah. sure. What are some lessons learned mistakes that you've made around challenges? Oh my gosh. So the, I would say what I have played with and tested over the years is the length of time. Like we talked about earlier, right? So five days initially was the perfect length for me. Um, but like I, like we talked about 
as the program and the price grew, I tried seven days, five days, and then 10 days was just the perfect amount of time. So the length, what I talk about in the, the challenge content was, has definitely grown as well. And so it's been a test over the years to see like, what is the perfect amount of information where I'm giving incredible value. It's the challenge prompts are short enough that people are able to do them and not get overwhelmed, you know, cause 10 days is a good amount of time. If you have to sit down and do an hour's worth of work for 10 days, it's super overwhelming. Yeah. So like, what is the perfect amount of time? Um, how do you help people get results in 10 minutes, 15 minutes a day? Right. So just playing with the challenge prompts. Um, and also something that I've really seen over the years is, and it took me a, a good while to learn is that, you know, I have this, I, I know many of us do this thing where I'm like, Hey, I have to give value. I have to deliver what I promise. And so I have a tendency, especially with my engineering background to be very tactical and focus on do this, do this, do this, do this. Yeah. And over the years, I noticed that sometimes people would be asking me a lot about emotions and fears and how to overcome them. And when I would talk about that, it would be even more powerful for them than just saying, hey, here are all the tactics. Yeah. And so I actually added in a day during my challenge, right around the halfway point, I believe, where I talk about, hey, here are the most common fears right? Here is how I think through them, how I handle them, how at this point I've helped over a thousand clients handle them. And that day is usually one of my most popular days. And I, when I started doing this a few years ago, I remember being so surprised, like, wait, but okay, it's, it's not, you know, tactical. And it took me a while to wrap my head around, oh, wow, this is still massively valuable because we all have those fears. I had them myself. And yeah. hearing about other people having them, realizing that it's just something you work, like everyone has, not just you, um, is just massively helpful. Sure. And so I would say those are some of the, the top lessons learned. Yeah. What are some fears that you had and how did you get over them? Basically any fear you can think of, I probably had it. Yeah. Uh, like nowadays I tell people that I'm an introvert, that back that uh, like five, six years ago, I couldn't do live streams. Uh, people don't believe me. <laughs> and a lot of my live streams are no longer available because I didn't save them. And when Periscope, um, the, the, the program I was using to save them is no longer available. And, but I, I wish I had kept them because my like, first live streams, I sound like a robot. Yeah. literally. Um, I'm like, and this is what you do, right? Because I just, I felt so uncomfortable talking on video. Like I'm sweating. My face is glistening. It's kind of gross, but I mean, you do what you have to do. And the way I wrote content. So my copywriting, uh, I didn't know what copywriting was. I wrote the way we're all taught to in corporate, which is very robotic and things like, please advise. Now, uh, I, yeah. that, right? I see that and I laugh not to be mean, but I'm like, I have so been there. Totally. And so, um, all of those were huge and I'm a very private person as well. So I didn't feel comfortable sharing on social media. I was like, I just want to stick to the facts. I don't want to talk about my personal things. And it took me a really long time to realize you don't have to spill your guts all over social media, but if you share some things about your personality, your background, people want to know that you are a real human being that yeah. they can relate to. Yeah. And so I would have to say though, that was one of my top fears, just being visible. Mm. Another one was that I was really scared if it would really be possible to replace my income. Because I didn't grow up around any entrepreneurs. Like I said, I didn't see any examples of people who had had a good job already and built a business and had done so in a relatively short amount of time. And we're talking about, uh, you know, anywhere shorter than like five to 10 years. Mm -hmm. And I was thinking, I'm not going to leave my job and I don't know, eat ramen or something for five to 10 years. That's silly compared to what I could be making and irresponsible, to be honest, financially. Uh, and so, I, I was afraid like, Hey, can, I've spent decades building up my career, studying, investing. Can I really do this in a short amount of time? Yeah. And that was a huge fear. Uh, I'll wrap up with one other one, which was massive. The fear of selling. Hmm. Right? Yeah. Uh, so uh, as many of us are taught, I had been grown up or I grew up being taught that 
selling is bad. And I remember talking to my parents where there were times when I had a salary raise or um, when I first made six figures in my job, I called my parents and told them. I was so excited. And my dad just said, mm, you're not worth that much. And mm. yeah, he wasn't saying it to be mean. It was just his perception and the way I was raised was that money is hard to make. You uh -huh. don't ask for a salary, like six figures, like, whoa, you know, yeah. and you just, you like, you take what you can get and you're grateful for it because money is hard to make. You should be grateful for having a job and you just live your life and, and don't rock the boat. Yeah. And so this whole, Hey, I can charge a premium. I can make more money than I did in my job. I mean, back then it was, can I even make the same amount? Yeah. But that same mentality was huge. And it was this fear of, am I being a bad person? If I make more money, am I being a bad person? If I'm charging people, am I being a bad person? If I'm claiming the value that I can bring because of my knowledge and experience. Yeah. And so that was a huge fear that I had to work through. And I did that through first by practice, right? When you practice and people are like, Oh, whoa, I would love to pay you this to hire you. You start thinking, Oh, okay. If they would love to pay me, maybe I'm, you know, something needs to change in how I'm thinking about it. Yeah. And then also spending a lot about money mindset, how to think about money and really change my mindset around that. How did you do that? How did you change your mindset around money? Especially, oh, I think that's hard, yes. especially if you have parents that have like instilled that in you. Exactly. You know? I mean, for a long time, I didn't even realize money mindset was a thing to, Oh yeah. Most people, people struggle don't. with. Exactly. <laughs> Again, it's not something we're taught in the corporate no. world, you know? And so I have to say, thankfully I, stumbled on upon uh, people who are talking about it in these Facebook groups. So that really worked out well. And I was like, what is this money mindset thing? Is this a scam? You know, like, what is this? And uh, eventually I was led to this book, uh, two books that really completely changed the way I think about it. The first one is Psycho Cybernetics by Maxwell Maltz. Mm. And what he talks about is, because I, before that I had read books like Think and Grow Rich and uh, what's the other pop, the other pop, the two, the two that are really popular along those lines. Um, and I remember thinking, what? I'm just going to think I'm going to be a millionaire and it's going to happen? Yeah, right. Right. I didn't get it. Yeah. And so when I read Psycho Cybernetics, it was written by a plastic surgeon who really uh, noticed that. Sometimes when he did plastic surgery for people, because their outward appearances would be completely changed, their whole demeanor would change. But mm -hmm. sometimes people wouldn't, they would still act as they had before their surgery. And so he started researching into what affects this? How, how is it possible that there's such a big difference between people? And he started setting, oh, it's about how we see our, perceive ourselves, how we think, and how we think literally changes how we act. And yeah. that changes our reality. I was like, oh, now I get the science behind why Think and Grow Rich, that that stuff is talked about. Yep. And so that opened my mind to that. And then I read uh, Margaret Lynch's Tapping into Wealth. And that broke down is specifically the top money blocks that many of us have in terms of thinking about money, our worth, what we can earn, how hard we have to work. That was a huge one for me. And I mean, it wasn't like I read it and things change. I had to read it over and over. Like for the first two years or so, I found that book. I literally had it at my desk and it was like my kind of like money Bible. I just, I had, a, oh my gosh. Okay. I'm feeling really scared. Can I really charge this? Okay. Let me reference this block, yeah. things like that. And so it was, it was a, it was like working out, you know, you work out, work out, work out. And I just constantly did that and bit by bit shifted the way I was thinking. I think that's huge. You know, repetition is the mother of skill. And a lot of times people expect to be like radically different, you know, tomorrow. And you just kept working on it, you know, yeah, over I mean, time. Because think about it. I love that you pointed this out because it's like this thought process that we have had programmed into us over decades. Yeah. It does not just change with a snap of your fingers. Yeah. I mean, maybe sometimes it does, but most of the time it does not. It's something where, you know, you think it, then you think, it's easier to think something that you're used to thinking than it, it is to think something completely new. And so I would, for example, I would read about, okay, I can make X amount of dollars, whatever it was, and I can own it. Then I would have a call with my parents where they would say, oh, you know, um, 
thing, you know, don't be too confident. Things will go, get bad. You yeah. know, like, have you run out of money yet? Yeah, things like that. Yeah. And I would, I would say, oh my gosh, that is that really what's going to happen? Then I would go back to the book, read about this and say, okay, you know what? Yes, I can be practical, but at the same time, I don't need to think like that. Yeah. And so it was just a constant uh, kind of mental tug of war. And I mean, to this day, it's still something I actively have to work on. Just like, I mean, just like working out, right? You don't work out once or for a year and then be done. It's a constant process. But I mean, it's, it's just part of what you have to do to be the person, to think like the person that you want to be. Totally. What's the biggest piece of advice you would give to an entrepreneur? So someone, are you, are we talking about someone starting out or at a certain point in their business? Um, maybe both. So when you're just starting, what would you say? And then once yeah. they've, maybe they're, they have money coming in, but they really want to scale yes. to seven figures. Oh. What would you tell them? Okay. So I love this question then. So the, for someone starting out, I would say just start, take action. Yeah. Um, and more specifically get in front of people. Because the thing is, especially with aspiring entrepreneurs, way too often I see them spending so much time on thinking or overthinking totally. or doing things that yes. don't matter. Because it's scary. I get it. I've, I've been there, right? Yeah. So like, oh, I'm going to work on my website. I'm going to, you know, think about if this marketing idea sounds good. Have yeah. you talked to anybody? No, I'm going to do that later, right? Whereas like, like the story I shared about how I got my first client, I had no clue how to sell, how to, um, how to really do anything marketing sales related. All I knew was how to run ads, what worked, what didn't. I knew how to share that and I knew how to talk to people, which we all do, yep. right? And I just did that. And if you do that, that can, and you just connect with people and share what you know, that can overcome so many skills that is, are going to take you a good amount of time to build up. So mm -hmm. I would say do that for, I didn't even have a website when I made my first sale, right? Like forget all the fancy stuff. You're going to get to that down the road right now. Yeah. Go talk to people, make that first sale. The money-making activities. Like, yes. Oh exactly. my gosh. I just had to get on one of my students because she was spending hours trying to create graphics in Canva. And I was oh like, gosh. nobody's going to say, I want to work with you yes. because you have the most beautiful graphics. Like this oh, is someone you could yes. hire someone for $5. Go do the money-making activities, exactly. girl. <laughs> no, I love that we're on the same page because it, I feel the same. Like I've been there once yeah. I started oh, yeah. at 4 a.m. in the morning working on a pop-up and I like it drew me no, it drew no subscribers because, yeah. um, I, I had no traffic to my website, you know? So it was like, no money. Exactly. I love this. We're so on the same page here. Um, I would say for someone wanting to get to seven figures, my advice would be focus, ruthless focus, because what I see at that point, like you've made some good money, right? It's a tendency to start overthinking, like to get maybe a little bit cocky and to be like, okay, what's this new shiny thing I can go do? Whereas to be honest for like six to multiple six, often to seven figures, it's really doubling down on the things that have worked already. Yep. So it's not necessarily creating another product. Product. I, I mean, I spent about the first two or three years in this business making multiple seven figures before I rolled out a second product, yeah. right? Cause I was focused on, I'm going to create one amazing program. I'm going to improve it. I'm going to build up the brand, the testimonials, all of that. I'm going to learn how to really share its value with people and sell it well before I do anything else. Um, focusing on one system to sell it. Really, I perfected my, I mean, there's always room for improvement, but I really optimized my challenge launch process to make sure it was consistent, it was reliable, uh, something I could scale and really set up my business so that it was a, a system. It wasn't me constantly running off trying to do this and this and that. And so basically, you know, know the, deliver something amazing that you really believe in, learn how to sell the heck out of it, deliver the heck out of it, get amazing testimonials, build an amazing brand and scale it, right? Because at the end of the day, it's like for this type of business, what is it? What, what does it come down to? It comes down to the leads that you have coming in, leads turning into prospects on your email list, prospects into clients, right? And so if you focus on just those three things, increasing your leads through whatever uh, sources of traffic that you can work on and focus on, and even for a lot of people, maybe it's focusing on a few sources of traffic. So I grew my business in the first few years on paid traffic. Mm -hmm. And that's because that's, that's what I knew, right? Yeah. And so that's what I focused on. I didn't 
uh, try and do like YouTube. I didn't try and do uh, organic traffic or a ton of it. I just doubled down on what I knew. And I knew down the road, I would, ex I would expand into other sources. But first I wanted to master relatively uh, one source so that I had a steady source of traffic and income. Yeah. And so doing that, getting really good at turning those leads into people on my email list and then turning people on my email list into customers. That was it. And so uh, often I see where someone, like we just talked about, make, making even you know maybe $5,000 a month anywhere to maybe low six figures and be like, okay, what's next? What's next? What's next? Guess what? Doubling down on what you already have. Huge, huge, awesome. What does it mean to you to make an impact? Ah, oh, man. That is a big question. So when I think about making an impact, I really think about one person at a time. Mm -hmm. I used to think, oh yeah, I'm going to impact so many people, you know, millions of people. And that's amazing. I mean, that is the goal. But really when you're writing an email, when you are creating any piece of content, when you're creating your programs, your offers, whatever, coaching programs, anything, guess who's going through it? One person at a time. Mm -hmm. And so nowadays, and this is something I have to constantly remind myself of continually, uh, whenever I'm writing something, I think about who's one person that I want to read this, that what do I want them to get out of them? If they're sitting in front of their computer, if they are where I was, they're alone, they're not supported, they're wondering if this is even possible, how am I going to help them change the way they think, what they're doing, so that bit by bit, they are seeing progress and building their confidence. And then, of course, ultimately changing their lives, right, and doing what they want to do, building the business and life they want to build. But it starts with what's that first change? What's that one person? And how are they going to be affected in a positive way? I like it. Start with one. Where can we connect with you? Yeah, so um, there are a few places. I'm gonna focus on the top ones where I am. So I've got uh, a really great PDF that if you sign up for, you'll get added to my email list and you'll get my fun kooky emails. Um, and it's a PDF with an outline of how to build your own six-figure online business. And the top three mistakes to avoid that I see so many uh, new entrepreneurs making. So that PDF is at, uh, I'm going to say it and then I'm going to spell it out because my name is not spelled how it sounds. The link is luisajo.com slash gift and it's spelled L-U-I-S-A-Z as in zebra, H-O-U.com slash G-I-F-T. We'll so put it in that, the show notes too. <laughs> okay, perfect. <laughs> so that, if you go there, I mean, my website is luisajo.com as well. You can check out my blog. I have lots of really great in-depth in-depth articles. Um, and then nowadays, right now, I'm really active on Instagram. I'm loving that. And so my Instagram is really similar. It's luisa.jo, so first name, dot last name. And uh, those are the two best places to connect with me. Cool. Well, it's been so inspiring just to hear your journey and everything that you've been through. So thank you so much for being on the show. My gosh, thank you so much for having me and just for asking these really targeted questions. Yes, I love it.